Hello, I'm Dr. Hannah Yellen, Senior Lecturer in Media and Culture here at Oxford Brooks, and I'm the network lead for the Creative Industries Network, who have brought you this amazing festival. Welcome to the final, final finale event uh, of what turned out to be a huge and wonderful inaugural Creative Industries Festival. Um, thank you, everyone in the audience, um, for coming and um, often repeatedly coming back for more and more events um, as it's your incredible engagement and questions and chat that have been a big part of making it feel like such a success. And as always, today, please keep those comments and questions coming in in the chat box while we're talking um, and do introduce yourselves. We just love to know where you're coming from. And, and as, yeah, as we come into the end of the festival, we'll be posting in the chat box a feedback form. Um, and we're really grateful if you can fill that in because it helps us prove the worth of these kinds of events uh, and helps us get the support we need to keep doing this kind of thing in the future. Um, you will have had a little notice saying that we're recording today. If you don't want your face in the background, uh, it's a little square, turn your camera off. Um, but the very cool thing about um, all of these, this these recordings we've been doing is that they're already up online for the rest of the festival so the whole month's worth of um, events including yesterday's and today's are all up online and we'll put a link um, to that so you can catch up um, on anything that you've missed. So today we're talking about gender and sexism in the creative industries we've been talking about diversity and inclusion in many many forms throughout the whole month um, and, and one thing that we haven't really talked about is things like the Me Too movement that we've seen in the Hollywood film industry. Um, but even there, I'm talking about it in the past tense, um, you know, uh, that reveals some of the challenges of making lasting systemic change, even after seismic disclosures and immense bravery from women revealing predatory and abusive behavior in an industry built upon exploitation and misogyny. Um, and while we haven't seen the same in the music industry yet, there have been significant instances of individual disclosure. Uh, as far back as 2014, we had Kesha suing Dr. Luke. And just this week, we had a Lady Gaga in a documentary with Prince Harry um, disclosing that she was raped by a senior music industry figure early in her career. So we know that both on stage or behind the scenes, women's status in the music industry needs interrogation. On an industrial level, women have to fight for their seat at the mixing desk. Of the world's 600 most popular songs in 2019, only 2% were produced by women. And the gender pay gap at some of the biggest music focused companies is a staggering 30%. And just 14% of performers at US festivals were women in the year before COVID closed it all down. Now I'm so, so, you can probably, you know, even across Zoom, feel it off me. The, I'm so excited that our star guest today has a long history of feminist campaigning across both acting and music and, you know, the wider creative industries in general. It really is an honor and a privilege to have Kate Nash here to close our festival. She started out in the music industry in 2005, which to my ears doesn't sound that long ago, but it's actually 16 years. What? <laughs> uh, in that time, she has released music through independent labels, huge labels, and completely independently. So what an amazing perspective today about women's agency or lack thereof in different contexts of the music industry. Uh, 2007 hit single Foundation set the tone for a career which has been characterised throughout by smart takes on issues of gender and misogyny in an impressive range of media. Um, so as well as her singing career as a, uh, a Brit, Q, Enemy and many other award winning uh, singer songwriter with a platinum selling album, she's also made a feminist documentary called Underestimate girl and it's available on iPlayer right now so if after today's session you just want more Kate and why wouldn't you uh, I strongly recommend um, you go and watch that if you're in the UK um, and then there's her acting career which is also favoured roles that interrogate gender like my absolute favourite glow where she played a female wrestler called Britannica uh, she's a vocal activist who has made political statements throughout her career, supporting pussy riot, feminism, LGBT rights, Labour Party, homelessness after the Tottenham riots, that's where I live, they got Tottenham, 
Um, and then throughout the festival, all of these themes are what have been coming up again and again, right? The intersecting inequalities faced by people in the creative industries or trying to get into them. Uh, how we make this sector safer and more hospitable and rewarding for people from a wider range of backgrounds and celebrating the contributions of diverse creatives. That's what we've been talking about for a month. So I can't think of anyone better to close up this amazing month of conversation. And we are incredibly lucky to have her here today, like right now, because she's so busy. She released her single, like, what was it, six days ago? Uh, and she is in just has just kicked off um, a COVID safe um, uh, and you know, creatively brilliant uh, tour. The, the yeah, live music coming back, people. <gasps> um, so anyway, also, I have to introduce the, who we've got interviewing her today. We've got the inimitable Maxi Gedge. Now, she works with PRS Foundation, who is the biggest funder of new music in the UK. And she works on the Key Change Initiative, which gets people, organizations across the music industry to pledge to a 50-50 gender split, uh, which is a method of campaigning for equality, which has already proven amazing results, which maybe Maxi will tell you something about today. She owns her own record label, Gravy. She plays with the bands Graceland and Current Bond, and is a kind of all-round Spengali fixer kind of person in the music industry. Honestly, she knows everyone. She's also my son's godmother, coolest person she knows. Um, and I promise I didn't just do that so that he'd grow up to be cool, but she's already given him an electric guitar and amp for his third birthday. Uh, <laughs> so she's, she's definitely to be cool. <clears throat> now I'm going to shut up and I'm gonna let Maxi ask, ask the questions. But I'll be coming back in the last kind of 15, 20 minutes or so to go through any questions and comments that you put in um, to the comment box. So just keep those coming throughout. Uh, and those can be questions for both Kate and Maxi, or Kate or Maxi. So yeah, Maxi and Kate, thank you so much for joining us today. It's, it's an honor. Over to you. Thank you, Hannah. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, I feel great now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we could just talk about everything that you've just mentioned and have a, have a lovely chat, but I do have some questions. Um, <laughs> Um, and I feel like I should start by thanking Hannah. Um, it, I know this has been a huge undertaking at a particularly intense moment. Um, and so I hope that um, the, the, um, um, the team can celebrate um, at the end of this show. Um, and um, I hope that um, in kind of doing all of this work, Hannah, in such an intense period, it's kind of not showing the power of um, hard work, but the power of the creative industries and how important they all are at this time um, for, um, for everyone, but you specifically, Hannah, love. Um, so um, yes, I am Maxi. I work for um, Key Change. Um, I'm the project manager in the UK and we are an international movement and campaign for gender equality. So we have, as Hannah mentioned, a pledge where any organization in the music industry can sign up and have a kind of contract with us um, to commit to achieving 50% representation of women and gender minorities in any area of their work. So that can be um, on stages, in boardrooms, in the workforce, um, in studios, um, conservatoires, orchestras, um, any organization working in music can um, speak to us and commit to change, commit to taking that first step towards um, positive representation in the music industry. Um, as Hannah's just said, there are so many horrifying stats um, that do not just show um, a lack of representation, but a, an overall <laughs> lack of um, inclusion um, and uh, um, a, a huge structural problem that um, we're trying to fight. Um, we also have a talent development program. So we're funded by Creative Europe to work with 74 awesome women and gender minority individuals every year um, across 13 music festivals in Europe and Canada, um, where we have mentoring programs, we have inspirational talks, um, we have creative sessions, um, we have panel discussions, showcases. Um, so we have um, this pledge where we work with organizations and a program where we work with individuals 
um, and they work together to, to hopefully ultimately make meaningful and long lasting change. Um, so I'm super psyched to say that Kate is an ambassador for Key Change. Um, a very fitting ambassador is someone who um, is so outspoken um, for these issues in the music industry and has driven us to work harder to make change as well, which um, is um, totally awesome. Um, so Kate, would you like to, I mean, Hannah's already given you an amazing introduction. Would you like to introduce yourself to the group yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone. <laughs> Hi, it's so, it's so cool to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I think, I don't know how I can top that introduction. It'd be weird <laughs> if I tried to as well. Um, but yeah, I guess like I've been playing music for a long time and like Hannah said, I've done it very differently throughout the years. I've had a lot of this going on. And I would actually say about the documentary, it, it's, it is really worth a watch. Not, you know, even if you finish this and you're like, I don't want any more <clears throat> of her. It's a really interesting perspective, you know, of them it just shows the music industry I think in a really interesting light and I had so many other musicians contact me after that came out saying that the exact same or very similar thing had happened to them and it's a very kind of common story um and I feel like I've you know obviously I had success this kind of mainstream success with Made of Bricks that's given me this platform that's kind of it seems to be lasting really even though I'm not in the same limelight and I'm not the, the same level of <clears throat> you know pop success I still have a big voice when I want to and that is the reason that I continue to use that voice is because it's like a privilege to have that and I have I know of people that don't have that voice and have had similar similar experiences to me and maybe not recovered from it or quit music or you know gone into depression or whatever it is <clears throat> sorry I have like allergies at the moment so I've got like hay fever -y cough I'm going to be dry coughing all the way through this just so you know now uh yeah but it's um it's it's not an easy industry to be in it's the most unprofessional industry in the world I think <laughs> yeah. we have zero sort of industry standards and I think that that's something since moving into TV and film that was really highlighted to me is how unprof unprofessional my entire career and experience of my career had been. And, uh, and so that's what made me even more passionate to kind of like work with Maxi to see if we can really do something about that because people get hurt because it's mm. not professional. Mm. Mm. Um, and I mean, we'll get to your response to that and and this the, the initiative that you're kind of building at the moment but um I wanted to first congratulate you on misery it's so rad love the strings um, <laughs> and um ask about your experience of starting in the music industry and how you felt like when you started playing and performing and recording did you feel vulnerable or powerful um or hopeful or cynical when you kind of started playing shows and stuff yeah I guess I felt a bit of both I'm not cynical but I definitely felt scared and excited I had I was working in Nando's and all my friends had gone off to university and drama school <clears throat> and I'd really wanted to go and I got rejected from everywhere so I didn't get into university and I was really feeling sorry for myself and uh working in Nando's and I had a I had this serious heart condition and I had surgery for that and after I had that surgery I think it sort of spurred me on to just kind of like living my life and doing what I wanted to do rather than I was I'd always wanted to play a gig but I was too scared I felt like it wasn't my place to play a show um I think there's a feeling when you're outside of music that like when you see other people on stage and they're doing something, you're like, oh, I can never do that. And that's not really for me. And that's for those kinds of people. And it's, I don't think I could ever be that person. And, uh, but after like facing this big, like heart surgery, I think I was just a bit like, you've got to live now because you never know when it could all be over. And I went to my local bar called Trinity in North Harrow, or in, in Harrow. Um, and I, I'd made like a demo, um, and gave them my CD and like my, the link to my MySpace page. And I booked my first gig 
And I really remember, I was so nervous. I was like sick the whole day. I couldn't believe I'd done it. And I, I had that feeling when you get on a roller coaster and you're like, why have I done this? It's just a, such a bad decision. Um, and I was so lucky because loads of my friends came down to Harrow like to support me. And I just remember being on stage and being like, oh my God, this is so fun. I just had such a fun time and really enjoyed it. And um, <clears throat> and then afterwards, the promoter gave me 30 quid. That was like what I got paid. And I was like, oh my God, I just got paid to do this. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> I was like, 30 quid, wow. <laughs> like I hadn't sort of thought, I was like, oh, maybe I could actually like make some more money from doing this. I hadn't really done it mm. for that reason. Obviously I didn't do it for the 30 quid, but like it just, when I, I really, I just really remember that money going in my hand and me, <laughs> huh, hmm, okay. Maybe I could get paid to do this. I didn't really think, okay, that's what, that's what happens. Like people get paid to do gigs. Okay, cool. And I just really <clears throat> dove straight into MySpace. And I remember getting an email, a message on MySpace from the Barfly. And I was like, oh my God, I've made it. Like, Because <laughs> so many bands that I loved have played Barfly. Um, and so it was just such an exciting time to like, that scene in London in 2006 mm. and 7 was so fun. And I think MySpace is one of the best things that's ever happened in the history of music. And it 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 was completely run by teenagers. Mm. There was no gatekeepers. There was no playlisters. No one was deciding who was successful. And that's why you have like this really interesting like, like music that came out of that, that era is because no labels were in control of it. Literally, it was teenagers taking songs and putting them on their profiles and and then people bands putting like their friends in their top eight and that's how what was making up the charts and obviously that went away and now we have all the gatekeepers again but it was a really exciting time and I think I was like in this lucky moment where you could just pass freely um, yeah. you know into that channel being like run by teenagers which is amazing and yeah I I think then it did start to get things started to speed up really quickly for me. And I remember feeling like things just got, a, like it's a bit of a blur looking back to be honest, because things just went so quick. And I have no family that are famous. I've no family in the music industry. I'd absolutely no idea like what any of that was. Like very normal, my mum's a nurse, my dad's a systems analyst. Like we don't have any experience of that lifestyle and it was quite a shock and I do remember some gigs I remember playing Hammersmith Apollo and it being sold out and I got this little like plaque and I just was like I just don't feel anything I'm really numb and I I don't know how to connect with this audience because all of a sudden I'd gone from like just becoming comfortable playing in front of 100 people to then standing in front of 10,000 people and having no idea how to connect with a, a room that large um and that was a journey as well of like you know mm. learn, understanding performance but it was a mix of you know then also I was quite bullied by the British media and like mm. a teenager and bullied for like my acne and weight and looks and everything and um mm. it was um it was definitely a mix of emotions and it took mm. um yeah you know like any 18 year old any 17 year old 18 year old like you just it takes a while to kind of find your feet I think of like who you who you are and like it's so much about your identity at that point too but I mean yeah I don't know it was it was a mix <laughs> yeah I mean and it it <clears throat> sounds like um you you mentioned um feeling scared at, um at one point in that um um response and I mean when did you when did your gender become a part of that when did you realize hang on I don't see many people like me I don't work with many people like me um yeah. and and was you when you said scared just then did, did you mean like the intensity of it or did you mean that you actually felt surrounded by people who could be predatory I think scared was like there's things that you can't control I think everybody gets a taste of that now in 2021 on social media but like I remember the first horrible message I got on MySpace I'm gonna am I allowed to swear I'm allowed to swear if I'm a grown-up I think so yeah yeah yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good I remember the first yeah close of his I remember the first 
message I got on MySpace that was really horrible. And it was like, you are dot, dot, dot. And I've been getting so many like sweet messages of people. And I was like, oh, what's this going to be? And I opened it and it said, everything that's wrong with music distilled into one slag. Why don't you go stick a bomb up your cunt and explode? I've never forgotten it because it was like so epic. It was like the most epic insult I've ever been given. And I was like, oh, okay, okay. This side of it, you know, which to be honest, still now, if someone like throws a weird insult at me, I get a bit like, oh God, I forget those people are out there just like throwing insults around really casually. It's just so weird to me, but people do it. There's, you know, the keyboard warrior aspect. Um, and I remember being like uh, shocked by it. And then like bits of press were coming out about me and even the good stuff, because I, I was reading it at the beginning, because, you know, you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm in this magazine and that. And then I I remember, like, really crying in my bedroom one night, and I remember making a decision, like, I've, I've got to stop reading anything, because even the good stuff makes me feel weird, because the truth is you can't summarise a human being in an article. You can't. Mm. And that's what journalists often are trying to do, and they often have, like, an imprint already of what they want to say about you on the page. So that yeah it was difficult and I was like okay I'm I'm scared of this so I need to like stop that and then there was the aspect of like um yeah I really remember one night on a tour bus going to bed early because I was like this atmosphere is so masculine and I just feel uncomfortable and I went in my bunk and I was like this is my bus like I'm (laughs) paying this bus and I'm uncomfortable And that's not right, you know, but it's also a weird thing to figure out that you're the boss when you're 18. I was scared of money. I Mm. I got a publishing deal from Universal and I I hated dealing with that. I hated Mm. like the idea that I would be dealing with this large sum of money. I had no idea what to do with it. You know, I was working at Nando's. Mm. I went from like getting my minimum wage to like getting this check and thinking I'm terrified of that. And also I'm terrified of how that separates me from my friends and like, what do I do with it? How do I manage it? I'm, I don't want it. You know, like mm. I was really scared of sort of every aspect like that. Um, and then fame and all of that. I've always, always hated that. I was chased by paparazzi once, hated it. Mm. Like I never enjoyed that. I would go to like parties that were like award ceremonies and people were dicks as well. <laughs> like other famous people were dicks. And I was just like, I feel like I'm at school. And I really was so happy that I left school and now I'm back and I hate this. <laughs> so, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. And it, I mean, it sounds like you're the boss, but you're not in control. And, and I wonder if like perhaps DIY yeah. communities are actually your space. And oh my God, where... 100%. and curating like things and like, I'm in control of my team now. Like I pick who I work with. I work with amazing people. Like to be honest, changing my band was when my career changed into a much more comfortable position. I was, I, I, I had like a very rocky experience with some of my band members. (laughs) Some of them were great and I'm still friends with, and some of them weren't so great and tour managers and my manager was like a young, like coke head who just would like use would like use my name to like get ex-girlfriends and new girlfriends and like cheating his girlfriend on tour in front of me and just weird st- stuff like that that I was really didn't like and then I realized I could fire him and I did and I fired my whole band and I was like I want to all I want a girl band like I want all girls with me on tour now um um and yeah I'd met an amazing like female light engineer and uh, she's one of the coolest people in the whole world. She's so, just this funny, like, genius. And I think after having her, I was like, oh, I, could, I want female people. I want, like, females on the road with me. Like, And uh, I went to Guildford University and in, in, interviewed a bunch of students. So they were really green and, like, so wanted to do it. Um, and that's where I met, like, Linda and Emma, who are still in my band now. <clears throat> and they're, like, family to me. And getting them in changed everything because all of a sudden it was there was like certain egos that were gone and other people's like decisions about how everything should be was gone and I had just green excited people my tour manager became like a guitar tech that I'd worked with who was like the most enthusiastic person you've ever met like 
driving through fields in <clears throat> the countryside in England and just being so excited that there's like lambs there. And it's like, this is amazing. I was like, this is the energy that I want. Like that whole negative, like rock star, like I'm a musician, so I'm mm. moody and I'm, I'm angry and I hate, you know, and I'm too cool to talk to anyone. I hate that. And I just had all these like great enthusiastic people around me all of a sudden who had never done it before. So they injected me with a whole lease of like freshness and I could uh, reapproach my career and suddenly like, and connect with these incredible like female musicians. And like, also I knew, you know, it's not a secret to anyone. I think that like a lot of my fans were young girls and I was seeing those young girls and I was thinking like, they might not relate to me. They might be a fan of me, but they might not see themselves in me and I want there to be someone on stage that they could see themselves in so I want other women like on stage because I noticed that every artist's band were all men um <clears throat> and and making that decision and and it's one of the best decisions I've ever made in my career and yeah then then I went like I also got dropped and you know like you're saying like I'm comfortable in DIY spaces so so like I remember the first time I played um, Shepherd's Bush Empire with the girl band. I'd already played it. I'd played Hammersmith Apollo, sold out and felt nothing. And I was so happy and proud of like Shepherd's Bush. And I was like, this is one of the best moments of my career. And it's like less than this level of success that I've already reached. But it's, I'm so, I'm comfortable now. I'm a better performer. I'm happy with who I'm working with. I feel more in control. And that means like so much more than the other stuff which is rapid yeah. and it's going to change because not you know very few people are hot right now all the time mm. and even then I think there's you know ups and downs in in, the, in that world too mm. yeah I mean it, it sounds like you found your community and I think that's so important in music and I mean that's definitely something at Key Change that we try to bring about in in the participant program is creating this network of supportive individuals so when you go into any environment that you can't control you still feel kind of backed up by your community and you know that they're there um, and I think that's so rare in the music industry because of this kind of boys club that does actually exist like it is a yeah. thing golfing in the music industry is a thing and did and you, you have to help. encounter yeah sorry, sorry go on what is that? <laughs> I was just gonna say did you encounter that like did you see any of that in your um <laughs> A hundred percent. Even stuff like I think now I got told, you know, you get kind of told who's being like hired by you and it'll be someone who you know, it's just like connections and yeah, lots of men. And I remember I had this like guitar tech who was like just a roadie from like a very specific roadie world. And he would be like screaming and swearing from the side of stage, like at the band if things went wrong. And he was just always like aggressive and like that was a representation of me, mm. but hired by someone else. Because and he made me uncomfortable. He made me stressed out. Like it didn't mm. make my show better. It was all. It was like it added to this tension because it was like, well, he's done this for that, and it's like someone's favour through this and recommended through that. And so you bring on the people that you know. And and mm. yeah, just I mean, I've like seen a lot of worse stuff too. I, I like I've seen like grown ask like record label men delivering packets of coke to like 18 year old boys which because mm. they're in bands and they want to do drugs and it's like yeah that's great but like as an adult you shouldn't be doing that mm. <laughs> like mm. you know there's a problem with addiction in our industry and like many musicians die and just like I think now like I'm 33 and the, those people are were in their 40s I would never ever treat some of these like if I meet 18 year old musicians I just feel protective of them I'm like I yeah. know that we're going through loads of weird stuff and I'm just like here's my number like if you ever need to talk call me I would never be like delivering them drugs mm. <laughs> so mm. weird to me and I think people want to vicariously live through the musician and be cool and like be associated and like you have to realise that like that is happening every single night for that musician. So it's a lifestyle and you could be feeding a like a really unhealthy lifestyle. And that's the same with like sex and like um, what you're kind of encouraging people to do on the road because it's cool and because it's what other people are doing. Mm, it's yeah. very serious, actually. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, we've spoken a lot about the kind of 
failings of the music industry when it comes to supporting artists in that regard and I could talk I mean, about it all day yeah and I, I didn't actually know that you're a founding member of the FAC that's so rad yeah. um but I mean what we're talking about is a, like I think a complete lack of responsibility a complete lack of accountability um in like the structures of the music industry and their role in um actually providing a system that helps um creators do what they do best which is make music and um I wonder what you think needs to happen um and who who needs to um kind of start accepting that accountability a bit more for for change to happen in the music industry Um, I think I know one thing every head of every major record label needs to be fired like tomorrow and start over and put a, a woman in power or you know someone who doesn't identify as a woman but isn't a cis man like we we need those old school those people are they're not good like it's I was founder of the FAC and I remember the head of Universal brought me in to talk about it and I was like oh cool like that's cool the head of Universal wants to talk to me this is great and I, I felt like in a movie where um like the, 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 the detective is like shining a light in your face and like asking you questions. And he was like, why you're being used as a pretty face, obviously, because I couldn't have an opinion because I was a young girl. I didn't know anything. And that I shouldn't be like, you know, it's so, it's so interesting because the, the labels were so against the FAC and they were so against artists becoming educated or having an opinion on, or like, but they didn't step in to do anything about MP3s or the culture of the internet they didn't step in at all. They they kept saying that like uh, there was like this whole period where they were like vinyls coming back, vinyls coming back. No, it isn't. No, what are you talking about? Um, and then even though they didn't get involved early on, they still have managed to define streaming on their terms and screw artists in the process. And they are completely out of touch. They live in their you know really expensive like Notting Hill like multi-million dollar uh, pound homes or whatever, like they're so out of touch with reality. Mm. Um, They were interviewed this last summer by Parliament. It's really worth checking that out as well. You can find all that stuff online. And some of the quotes from that, some of the things that they said about artists and what artists want are laughable and shockingly Mm. like out of touch and bad and like, are they actually cartoon bad guys with cigars in their mouth? the answer is yes they actually act like that they 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 say stuff like artists don't really want to recoup what is what does that how can you say that of course they do they want to earn a living from what they do it's stupid Mm. and they don't care they've they've proved that they do not care about the well-being of artists and that they they like there's another head of a label that was quoted in a magazine that said like artists are like pebbles in a beach you just pick one up play with it for a while and toss it and there's like millions of others like I think they all need to be fired honestly mm. has to come at the top mm. if, I, if I could do that tomorrow if I could be give granted a wish I feel like I would do that <laughs> love it um and the the broken record campaign as well is definitely worth checking out um for, yeah um the- Tom Gray is doing amazing work yeah. he was you know in, in charge of all of those interviews in parliament yeah um yeah. Um, I'm aware that we're kind of running out of time a bit so I wanted Sorry. to cover um, your experience of mu- moving from the music industry into the sort of film and television industry and how that's um, impacted the activism that you're you're doing now um, so yeah what was it like um, working in film and yeah. television I mean it was amazing because I feel it was the most stability I've ever had in my career so all of a sudden I had a job and you go from like I went from being, you know, on and off tour and you're kind of creating your year um, and like trying to sell your own tickets and almost like being the driver of, you know, the train. And then I was like a passenger on the train, but or like, you know, a member of staff on the train, I guess. And I had a job for like five months of the year and I had my, um, you know, there was the production, there was SAG, there was so many people I could go to if I needed anything I noticed that the actors knew so much about what they were what, about their workers rights and that was really interesting to me because I've never seen that in music um 
And yeah, I mean, I was, you know, it was a comedy wrestling with 15 women. It was the most healing experience. And I feel it really saved me from like all the trauma of the music industry, to be honest. I, I felt like I was in the gutter after that. My self-esteem was in the gutter after everything that happened. And then I dragged myself out of it in the most liberating and fun way you could ever even dream of. You can't make that up. I mean, um, Brad. And, I know it's so mad <laughs> completely life-changing and um and yeah I think I saw the way that the tv and film industry responded also to the me too movement and I was directly impacted by that so there's a thing called an intimacy coordinator which is a job that didn't used to exist and it's someone who's there to work on any intimate scenes in in the production and all of the major networks have that now you'll see it in the credits of any show that's got sex or intimate scenes of the intimacy coordinator that job was a, was created because of me too and because of like times up and i was like oh that's really interesting like the acting the tv and film world has responded and i experienced that cuz i did a sex scene in season 1 where we didn't have that and a sex scene uh, sex scene in season 3 and it was a completely different experience. It was so much safer, it was so much more detailed. I was so much more comfortable. I was able to do a better job as an actor. And I found it really interesting. And I just thought, this is what the music world is missing. Like there's this huge gap where there's so much sexual assault and abuse and um, weird experiences with like heads of labels and no, there's no one to turn to. We don't have an HR department. We can't really go to anyone when stuff like this happens. It's so wild west, you know what I mean? There's not like, like even people's managers, it will be like their mate or some random person. It's like, you don't really have like an industry standard for anything in music. And then you're in nightclubs and it's, it's a night atmosphere of drugs and alcohol. So like things get out of hand really quickly. Um, so yeah, seeing, like, I think music loves to see itself at being at the forefront of culture. And for a long time, it really has been, but it's embarrassingly behind now. Mm. And I think we need to keep calling it out and saying like, look at TV and film. It's so much further ahead than you. It's still got its own issues, but at least it's responding. Music is completely ignoring all of these stories that women are coming out with. Mm. And In terms of the industry. Yeah, I mean, it feels like the music industry is also very disconnected. So there are people doing rad things, but they mm -hmm. do them in their own genres or in their own regions um, and in their own sectors. And it's very siloed and there's no kind of like music is um, the music industry is innovative and brilliant because it's so collaborative. But for some reason, when it comes to kind of pulling together um, our resources to make this positive change. It feels like a huge hurdle that we just, no one's speaking to each other and creating yeah. like a, um, a a targeted movement for change. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking, I guess, about the UK industry there. And that's kind of what we're trying to do um, at Key Change. And we've recently started a, an, an alliance that um, it's rad that you've been part of called Action Against Abuse, which tries to bring together um, um, organizations working to combat abuse and harassment in the music industry and, and set new standards, share knowledge, um, and hopefully um, yeah, bring about a new level of, um, or at least some processes in the music industry that deal with the instances that happen too often. Um, I'm aware that we've been speaking as if kind of it's like men against women and gender minorities, like men are the baddies um, of the music industry. Um, and I would love to lead into the safety chain with this and yeah. um, for you to tell us a bit about what you've been working on, because, of course, I mean, it's not as simple as that. Um, we know that um, most um, harassment and abuse in the music in the industry is gender based because of the, the research that um, that tells us that. Um, but what are you trying to do specifically in the safety chain? So uh, last summer, there was this huge scandal story that happened in uh, Los Angeles, where I live. And there's a record label called Burger Records, which is a small indie punk DIY label that became quite successful. Um, it would put on festivals and people like Iggy Pop would be playing. And like they had an all female festival where people like myself and Kimia Dawson and Kim Gordon and... Um, Kathleen Hanna and Cat Power were, were headlining. So they did really well. And, it, and you, if you knew a small, medium-sized band, uh, even larger, they would like have gone through Burger Records. They put out so much music. Um, 
And, you know, over the summer, all these stories started coming out online about sexual assault and abuse from the label, from the record store, from the people that own the store and the label to like many of the bands that were on that label. Um, and yeah, I guess their sort of ethos was very chaotic, punk, sex, drugs, rock and roll, like crazy, like that was their sort of vibe. And uh, lots of young women came out with stories against them and it, and it dissolved the record label in three days. So that was really interesting. And I had a connection to the label because I, I knew lots of bands and I would played their festival and I saw lots of people I knew speaking out about it. And it was this, you know, it's this interesting time of social media where everyone is speaking out about things all the time now. And I felt like I don't want to do that because it doesn't feel helpful. And I'm like, what can be the evolution from this talk on social media? Because like it doesn't leave anyone feeling good and it doesn't necessarily change anything. Um, that label being gone doesn't eradicate sexual abuse in the music industry. And like those bands breaking up or never being able to play, it doesn't eradicate it either. And toxic masculinity and th that culture of abuse is also harming the men that are, you know, causing harm right now. The, they're victims of something as well so I felt like I was in this unique position where I was connected to it but enough outside to sort of think about it a bit differently and I just thought something needs to be done and there's this I've got this experience of working with these intimacy coordinators which have made sex scenes so much safer these people need jobs in the music industry and we need to like create a space for them we need to create what that job is and I thought about my own sex education, which was abysmal. It was like robots making a baby and then that was it. And then it was like, good luck, go out and don't get pregnant. <laughs> and you learn about sex. A lot of us didn't have good sex education. We learn about sex from our experiences. And women tend to talk about that more in an emotional way. And men are stunted it, it, it's like toxic masculinity hasn't allowed them or encouraged them or nurtured their emotional like conversations with each other and so men often I've, I interviewed a lot of male friends and sort of talked to them about sex which was also really interesting because I hadn't really done that with them and it was like they were it, it was clear that either there was like men that talk about sex publicly and it's bravado and then men that see that and don't like that and want to make sure they're respectful and sort of avoid talking about it and being like, oh, do you talk about sex with your friends? No, because it's disrespectful to the woman. And I'm like, oh, that's so interesting, because then you're really never learning from each other. If something weird happens, you've never talked it out with your friend because you're trying to be respectful of the, the woman or person you've had sex with. But like you're not really learning how to deal with that weird situation because we all have weird sexual encounters. Um and so I thought we need a sex education and power dynamics platform specifically aimed at men. And rather than saying like, you've done this, you're canceled. It's like, all right, you're not ready actually. Like, basically I think the music industry is like Mad Men, the TV show where the boss in the office, they're all drinking during the day and shagging everyone on the office floor. And then HR came in and was like, oh, you can't do that. <laughs> But in the 50s and the 60s, that was fair game. And I think the music industry is still in the 50s and 60s mindset. And no one's come in and said there'll be consequences. But now we do have consequences. And I don't know if that's right or wrong, but like there's a threat to that male uh, existence in that space now because you'll be cancelled online. And I, mm. I don't like that. But in a way, it's been this incentive for, for people to listen and to start thinking, I better do something about this because now I, I could lose my career. Um, and, um, you know, women have been screaming into a void, I think, for a while about abuse and not believe. Mm. Anyway, we need an evolution from it because at the moment it leaves everybody feeling very damaged. And I know uh, I'm working with sex educators and intimacy coordinators to build this platform. And my dream for it is that it becomes industry standard. That's what I think we need. We need standards. Yeah. Uh, like you're saying, we're all disjointed. Like we need, mm. these are certain safety standards everyone has to abide by. And if you don't do a course with us, if you haven't worked with the safety chain, if you haven't done level one, you are not ready to go on tour. You're just simply mm. not ready because you are going to be uh getting dear you're going to have women contacting you and wanting to have sex with you and you've got to learn like you having sex with a fan is a completely different experience for you than that fan 
they know you in a completely different way they have a completely different emotional attachment it's a, it's a it's not an equal power exchange um and teaching us the difference between consent and acquiescence and even what is consent i think a lot of people don't really know what consent is um so i just see this gap and i think there's 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 people in other doing work in other areas that that can get jobs in the industry so i'm working to try and like make that happen brad um it's so awesome and i i think it's i think there is a you're right that there's a complete um kind of lack of boundaries and in the music industry full stop i think um like in it's interesting because i mean the, the environments that you're talking about you have that were positive for you you had control and mm. i wonder if you had to ever speak to 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 your the new band that you feel is a rad environment about setting those boundaries or if it was just kind of based on a mutual experience i feel it, it has been quite mutual i think yeah. like you know we know each other so well I can be really open if I'm unhappy about something but we we like I'm also just in a completely different place I know how to manage my emotions better and like um there'll be certain things that they can like I what I'm really adamant about is honesty I want to know everything Mm -hmm. what happens a lot of the time is that people don't want to upset the artist or cause you more stress so they don't tell you something's going on Mm. I hate that because that stresses me out more later because I'll find out there was all this tension and I probably could have helped resolve it. Mm. You know, whatever it's about, if it's about money or if it's about days or whatever it's about, I want people to always come to me Mm. because I'm in charge and I can help resolve it and we can just talk out. And like, I always, but like you still have to kind of push that. Even with people now, it's like, I know they just don't want to stress me out sometimes because being on the road is stressful, but I'm like, honesty, let's talk, let's figure it out because later it will become even bigger. De- we might just be able to resolve it really quickly. Yeah. Um, mm. And I think it's about a working relationship of me respecting them and them respecting me and feeling they can come to me and me making them feel like they can. So Absolutely. And I've seen Hannah's unmuted, so yeah, I think we're going to go to... I've unmuted to just kind of subtly slide back <laughs> into the conversation, if that's okay. Of um, course. At this point, I'd love to bring in some of the questions um, from the audience, because yeah. um, there's been a, a, few, a, a lovely active chat box. Um, thank you to our lovely audience for that. Um, so uh, one question, uh, sorry, I haven't kept all of the names of who asked which question as I was picking them over. That, that was... Um, fail from me but one um one question um, is about the complicity of the women in the industry that do have power um so one of our audience has observed uh art, that artists like yourself and marina um uh, are, are changing things and you know uh lady gaga Taylor swift and keisha have spoken out but that leaves a lot of other a-list women in the industry who who are not saying and and she was wondering whether you could speak to why that might be what the fear might be what the penalty might be I think there's so many different factors there's like a you just don't know where that person is mentally maybe they haven't recovered from whatever they've gone through they have gone through stuff they're in the music industry and a woman I guarantee it and maybe they're not comfortable um But also, like, I think musicians have been encouraged to, like, not do that. We've been encouraged to think that we have to fight for our little bit of what we have and there's not enough space and you'll be punished. And I mean, there are consequences, actually, for speaking out. Like, you know, I'm not like... It, like there, there, I know that there are consequences so there is fear I, I was really wondering actually sorry my own question I'll jump in there because it's exactly what you're talking about now but mm-hmm. he, here you are of course saying every head of a music industry needs to be fired um and it sounds to me like maybe that's something you've said before uh, although we do play I, I haven't space, actually but the idea just yeah. came to me I was <laughs> inspired moment. Okay, so I guess we'll find out what the uh, penalties are. now I was gonna I was gonna ask about the have you have you have you been blacklisted? Have you had penalties for these? Penalties? I wouldn't be surprised if I have. I found it. There's look. This is the honest truth. I don't reach the same numbers I used to. I can't like, but I'm quite happy. You know what I mean? I'm like happy in my life, and I'm happy in my career, and I'm earning money to like have a life that I like. I'm not like. 
I still get stressed and sometimes I'm like oh god like I I do wish certain things are a bit easier like I wish I could just get to a stable level of touring where I wasn't always going into the red or there's certain things I like wish were a bit more stable but in general I'm quite happy and I don't want to sign to a major record label ever again I know I, I mean I'd be so shocked if I do I don't know what would convince me to so I think I've just always been a bit of a like I I like like I I enjoy being outspoken and I I just enjoy causing a bit of trouble in a weird way like and I'm not doing it because I just think it's trouble I actually believe in what I say and I think that there is a lot to 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 complain about and I think if you don't I just see a responsibility I've I know people so what happened to me it's in my documentary my manager stole all my money and I had to move home and sell everything. I had to sell my flat. I, I couldn't afford to pay rent. I moved home. I had no idea what I was going to do and how I was going to do music again and blah, blah, blah. And it destroyed my confidence as well because I felt so stupid for having trusted someone who did that to me. And um, I met multiple people that had also had their money stolen by that man. And they had quit music. And they, their confidence, I don't know if it's restored now. And I obviously had such, I mean, how many people went to be on a wrestling show with comedians and like got their confidence back through that? That's really specific. And I'm so lucky to have that. And I just remember this moment where I was like, I'm going to come out about this. And this guy fucked with the wrong woman because I have a position of power and I'm going to use it and I'm not going to be silenced. And he actually in courtroom tried to get me to sign a piece of paper to never talk about it again. And I said, no. And I was like, the judge was like, trying to force me to do it because they that city doesn't want to like spend more money on your case so they're just trying to bully everyone to agree and I was just like absolutely I literally sat there and I was like I'm going to think of all my like Irish ancestors and just take this power into my vagina and just fucking do what I want and like I've got a responsibility because it, like when I tweet something it can get in the enemy or the daily mail or whatever it is and there's people I know whose lives have been destroyed by people in the music industry so I do it for them and I do it because I can and because I'm still happy and I've recovered. And I think that's why people like Rebecca Ferguson as well is talking out a lot about, about she's posting a lot of stuff because she's like, I've got a responsibility to the others before me who've been screwed over and, and aren't in my position and aren't happy anymore. So I don't give any shade because also this is an interesting thing to bring up. I know we're short of time, but I, we talked, uh, myself and Maxi are talking to um, a festival booker who we were both talking about publicly, you know, saying that they haven't booked enough females on their lineup, that we've got this like major um, gap in the festival lineups. And I sort of like called her out on Instagram and, and, and then we ended up having a Zoom and are on a WhatsApp and are like now you know, I'm trying to understand her position of what she's up against. So I think like that connection is really exciting to me because we're coming from very different areas. And I'm like, what's stopping you? We all want the same thing. So how do we get there? And can we work together rather than just wanting to like blame her because she didn't book them? Like what's, why didn't she get to book them? So maybe there's like a bit of understanding as well, but I don't know. Is there, did you want to speak to this point as well? Um, well, I just, on, on the point of um, why other women and gender minority artists aren't speaking out, I think it's important to say that the burden of change should not be solely on the shoulders of women and gender minorities, and especially not on the shoulders of victims. Um, because, I mean, that's um, like, that's quite, that's more dangerous. It's just escalating things more. So I think that um, like allies are really important and inclusion riders. Um, and it's important to say as well that a, a safe um, music industry, a safe cultural industry um, has a positive effect on everyone, not just women and gender minorities, but the whole industry. Um, like we're, we're not just um, existing in an unsafe, unsupportive environment. Um, but we're losing talent. We're losing music because we're not making this positive change. And that's devastating, not just as artists, but as music lovers, too. So I think that like only only when everyone actually takes responsibility and accepts that they are part of the problem, um, 
can we then start to make change and include everyone in the solution, which is what, what absolutely needs to happen. I mean, of course, um, there are unequal distributions of power in the music industry, so some people can make more change than others. But I think it has to be a collaborative industry-wide effort um, for the like dangerous and long-standing systemic structures um, to be shattered down like they need to be. And that's why an organization like Key Change with that overview uh, is so important and so val valuable. Um, okay, so we've got a, a couple of um, uh, young artists or artists early in their career in the chat box asking what would be the most important piece of advice to someone starting out about how to navigate the sexism in the industry or in the film industry or, or both. Um, and what red flags to look look out for, um, and how just how to set those boundaries and standards, uh, and do what one can, um, knowing what they're going to face. Yeah, I mean, I think um, your manager, the relationship with your manager is really important, and the relationship with like who's on the road with you is actually even more important. Like who's playing shows with you, who's around you most of the time. And making those those people, making sure those are people that make you feel safe and that like really believe in you, because you're going to have so many moments where you don't believe in yourself. So someone who like loves your music is passionate and um, shows a level of like professionalism as well. Like I think um, there's a lot of like unprofessional management, and it's kind of looking at how they treat other people around them. Um, the way they talk doesn't make you comfortable like I've gone through actually so many managers I think that it can also be fluid you can you can change if something doesn't feel right if you're like I don't really like this anymore you can move on um, and sort of knowing that you're in control of that but I think like I think my band have really been the saving factor in so many situations because you have to go out and like go on tour together it's like who's in your who's in your group who's going to be on the road with you when you feel horrible and you don't want to get up on stage like make sure those are like you know you know you're, that's there's camaraderie there and a the family feel there and it's fun and then management look out for how they behave when they come to a festival with you how they treat like other members of staff like um there's a lot of like managers doing stuff like uh, trying to prove their power so if something goes wrong they'll like bollock someone who did something wrong <laughs> and I always think I don't really want that you know what I mean I, that's representing me you don't have to sort of prove your worth by like being aggressive to someone else um, but yeah like also don't if someone's trying to force you into signing a co contract like guilting you into that you don't have to sign contracts as well like I've never signed a management contract ever um, I'm glad I didn't. Uh, the one person who really applied the pressure to try and get me to sign one is the one who stole all my money. So I'm extremely glad I didn't sign one with him. Um, just like, just know that like, oftentimes you'll be made to feel like things are the end of the world if you don't do them. And I don't think that's true. Um, Thank you. And yeah, try, yeah, I don't know. Is that good advice? <clears throat> Very good advice, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, and obviously, <laughs> with all of the experience that you've talked about over the last hour, we could probably keep going for a whole nother, maybe that's next year's session, um, yeah. the direct advice uh, giving session. Um, but um, uh, so one of one of the really, um, oh, there you go. There's the people who actually um, asked the question saying, yes, that was valuable advice. That they, oh, good. Um, yeah. And one of the really serendipitous things today is um, you've been talking about intimacy coordinators and we have the foremost researcher of intimacy coordination um, in the audience today. Oh my God, um, and so, amazing. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we should um, connect oh, you um, sometime. Really like because yeah. uh, she writes about the importance um, of it to consent culture. So I've got a question from her. Okay, um, great. It's Tanya Harek, and I'll put you in touch afterwards. Um, it's so fascinating to hear. Is, we're going to make this the last question, I think, um, just for anyone who's worried about... Um, Time. And I'm really, really sorry to anyone who's questioned. It's just so much to say. Um, so many problems to solve uh, as well. Um, so Tanya says, it's so fascinating to hear you speak about intimacy coordination. Can you please say more about how the experience of having an intimacy coordinator on set 
um, in season three of GLOW changed your experience of shooting sex scenes? What can the music industry learn from intimacy coordination? Uh, you've spoken to some of that already, um, but um, yeah, uh, just quickly anything that you can... Um, yeah, I can directly explain like, you know, being naked on set when there's like a bunch of people around with cameras and sort of it's not, an, it doesn't feel like a completely natural environment to be naked and like pretending to have sex with someone can be really nerve wracking and uncomfortable. And I was really surprised the first time it happened because you're just kind of thrown into the situation. And I was like, oh, I'm really unprepared for this. And it was very awkward and I hated it. And then when an intimacy coordinator came in, they came and sat down, we had a meeting with the director, the coordinator and myself and the actor. And uh, she explained her job, what was gonna happen and that the director was gonna ask for what they wanted and explain the scene, how they envisioned it. And then she was gonna take us aside together and talk about what we're comfortable with and like come to some kind of a compromise and then take us individually and ask us stuff like, is there someone we're not comfortable being touched? Uh, do we have herpes? Do we rather someone doesn't eat something before this scene? I'm going to be, you know, like 100% there for the actor and not the network. That was made very clear. And like things you don't think of, we're going to pad up your vagina so you can't feel anything. And if you sweat, I'm going to have spare, like all these things that you'd be embarrassed to ask or you wouldn't even think of. And then we did like rehearsals, clothed rehearsals where the intimacy coordinator is right there. They help you like, angle your body so you feel confident, breathing so it feels realistic, um, so much preparation. And before it was literally like, go do the scene. I was like, oh my God, what am I doing? I have no idea what I'm doing. So it's it's lots of things that you would never even think of, but they make all the difference. And I think, you know, there's like so many circumstances I've been thrust into music where I had no idea what to expect. And maybe some education on that would have helped me. Um, including being a better boss, being a better employer, like being able to treat people better myself. Um, and also, do you know what? I thought of one more thing that I was going to say about the advice to musicians is talk to other musicians, talk to other artists. Because one thing I really learned from Glow, we talked about what we, we were getting paid and we like tried to get um, bring up other people with us who weren't being paid as much. So that And that's like a really important thing because people are, there's like, sexism racism homophobic there's so many things that like come into that with like people's salary and 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 not necessarily that you can do that in the same way in music but um if you know if you know what other like sometimes you learn what's wrong because you'll hear someone else having a different thing and you're like oh that sounds better than my situation or you might hear them and it might be something worse and you could say i don't think that's right so talk to your peers like talk to your musicians find out what each other is being paid like how you're being treated what, how your manager dealt with something if you didn't like it run it past someone else and see what they think um like I think that artists need to be more open with each other and I think um that would make a really big difference to our industry if we communicated more you know I'm thank you thank you I'm I'm really sad to wrap it up here but I have to wrap it up here but it's been it's just such an amazing session. We've we've really got to what the problems are and they are cultural and they are institutional and they are wide reaching. And yet I come away feeling optimistic like there are things that we can do, um, you know, as individuals and things that are happening um, on that more structural level. And thank you both, both of you for um, making me feel that bit more optimistic whilst also seeing in a clear-eyed way that there are still serious problems well um, thank you thank you so much for having us and thanks uh, for me as well for it's, being no here. it's such a pleasure and you know this is it's so and everyone in the chat box if you know if anyone's not been reading the chat it's just ping ping pinging <laughs> saying you know kind of, you've uh you know what's the word uh, euphoric with um what a great session it's been and I'm just so happy that this was how we could end our first ever Creative Industries Festival. Yes. It's been an immense month, bigger than we could have imagined, better than we could have imagined. And, you know, we've not, we've been talking about um, all kinds of inequalities, you know, it's, we've been calling out problems today, but all month we've been talking about sexism, the racism, the ableism, the exclusivity, um, but crucially, we have brought people together who can share ways to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, like key change like ratio pledges 
like our conversations about mentoring to get around the problem of nepotism in the sector. We've had MPs here, we've had policy makers, we've had media producers and gatekeepers, all underpinned by the brilliant researchers um, at Oxford Brooks showing the importance also of research and um, expertise and the value. Yeah. I, I hope that at a time when the government is not supporting universities and making them worry about their future and not supporting art subjects in particular uh, and making them worry about our future that this month has been um, a statement on the value of these spaces for ideas to flourish, to be passed on, to then turn into action because um, those ideas can create a more equal and beautiful society. Um, and I think that's just been a huge theme today um, and, and throughout the month. Um, and, um, and most of all, we've just been celebrating such amazing, diverse creatives and the talented creatives as well. Um, and we're learning to, uh, if you want to learn to be more accessible, invite extremely uh, sharp, politicized, disabled creatives, and they will very quickly reveal to you how you can do better um, to make things more accessible as well. So we will be back next year and we will be even more um, knowledgeable, accessible, uh, inclusive uh, and diverse uh, and celebratory and rad um, and engaged on making things better. Um, and if you are in the audience or you're watching this later and you would like to speak at our future events, get in touch or if you've got an idea for collaborating, we exist to, uh, to do that. You know, we're here to collaborate and to make a difference. Um, until then, thank you, Maxi, for your expert questioning. Thank you, Kate, for your time and your expertise and your amazing, amazing perspective um, and just like motivational rallying cry. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming and also the brilliant uh, festival organizer team. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a great festival, and Maxi and Kate Bloody Nash, uh, you have taken us <laughs> out with a bang. So um, thank you. Thanks, everybody. We're 10 minutes late. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye.